Welcome everyone to the Mindful Money Seminar. Namihi nui kia koutou, nō mai hari mai. We're very pleased to welcome you along to this session. This is, uh, we were counting the other day, this is our uh, tenth session. Uh, and a uh, uh, very special one, we, we have a, a fantastic guest tonight, Sir Jonathan Porritt has joined us from the UK. Uh, eight o'clock in the morning over there. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, Jonathan. We'll introduce you in a second. I just wanted to um, say to people, we're posting these videos uh, onto our webpage. So if you want to catch up with any of the other 10 uh, videos, they're on the Mindful Money page, which is www.mindfulmoney.nz. Uh, and you follow the links to the uh, events page, so so you can find uh, not only the full videos there, but uh, but also we've got a uh, a short summary of them. Um, today we're going to to kick off uh, a uh, a discussion between me and Jonathan for 20-25 minutes. And my apologies to everyone uh, on Zoom. You're going to be on mute, um, so sorry to be authoritarian about this, uh, but. Um, you can and please do enter any questions, comments uh, into the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, for those of you joining on Facebook Live, do the same on the comments section on Facebook Live. That would be that would be great, and we'll harvest those and we'll uh, we'll uh, have the Q and A starting in about uh, twenty minutes or so. Um, so. Uh, I think that's about all. With the, without further ado, let me uh, 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 introduce uh, Sir Jonathan. Um, Jonathan's had deep roots in New Zealand since uh, since his very early days. Uh, more recently, he's been advisor to in New Zealand uh, as chair of their sustainability council, and he's the founder of of a fantastic initiative called the Aotearoa Circle, which we will show talk about uh, during this uh, this interview. Uh, Jonathan was chair of the UK Commission on Sustainable Development for nine years, uh, founder of the Institute Forum for the Future, and a leader in uh, Friends of the Earth, uh, WWF, and the Green Party. So um, his books include um, Capitalism as if the World Matters, which was uh, oh. a, a, a big seller. Uh, the World We Made uh, in 2013 and Hot Off the Press, or Almost on the Press, uh, soon to be released, uh, a book called Hope and Hell. And again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So we're talking tonight about the, the urgency of climate finance. Um, Jonathan, a very warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. Delighted to be with you. It's great. Good, good. So, um, We've been talking in this seminar series about the challenge for New Zealand uh, building back better. Uh, you've just done a, uh, a really interesting paper for the Aotearoa Circle, uh, which was presented at the forum for the late, late uh, Rob Fennick. Uh, I know he was a close friend of yours. Um, could you could you tell us a little bit about about the research and uh, about what you found when you looked at the, the notion of building back better across, uh, across I think, 16 different countries? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was very much a, a snapshot just to get a feel for what's actually happening out there in terms of government intentions. Um, it has to be said that practically nothing has actually started moving out of the door, as it were. You can't point to specific investments that have begun as yet, but these are more governments gearing up to recovery type programs now that they are moving beyond managing the pandemic itself. Um, and it was interesting for me, I must say, because there's plenty of good intent when it comes to governments that want to use some of their recovery spend to help promote low carbon prosperity, to go after the idea that we must address the climate emergency as part and parcel of whatever we do to get our economies back on their feet. There is much less going on in terms of governments that want to use their recovery programs to restore natural capital, 
protect the natural environment, put right some of the cumulative damage that's been done uh, to rivers, forests, soils over the last 20, 30 years. There's hardly any of that going on anywhere at all. The actual picture, however, right now, as in what governments have, have actually done to subsidize or provide bailouts for companies that are in trouble, that is not such a good picture. And indeed, that was confirmed recently by a report from Vivid Economics that looked at something like the $6 trillion that have already gone into uh, different interventions from governments to provide bailouts for companies. And at least $850 billion of that, so a fair percentage, has gone straight into carbon intensive, um, environmentally threatening companies. So the actual picture right now is, is pretty ambivalent, it has to be said, and there's still a massive amount left to play for, that's for sure. Yeah, and in New Zealand, we have a, a $20 billion war chest uh, for, for recovery that uh, uh, we're eagerly waiting to see the details uh, of that. But as well as the government, the, the financial sector matters. You know, we, uh, we see what they've got to lose in, for example, during COVID-19, the collapse of the fossil fuel companies, which has been quite spectacular. Uh, and and immensely dangerous for, for the financial system. Um, even so, and, and we see some now some statements starting to come from the finance sector, but over the past three decades, um, when climate change has been well on the radar of insurance companies and banks and, and investment companies, we haven't really seen the kind of, of integration of climate change into the way the finance system works. What do you think that, that uh, where, where do you think the failing has come from? It is pretty remarkable when you actually look at it cumulatively, as you say, going back over just even the last couple of decades as the science became uh, more and more definitive, as in there was less of a debate to be had about the science because the science just was the science and you could see exactly how fast things were going to move. <clears throat> now it has to be said that scientists are now warning governments that things are moving much faster than they said they would and they will be more severe and the impacts economically will be much greater so risk to investors in one way or another will be very substantial indeed. What was going on? in the minds of all of those smart people in the world's capital markets is, I think, a classic example of what Mark Carney described as the tragedy of the horizon, that they have always had a pretty fixed view that value lies in those revenue generating activities over the course of the next three to five years. And, you know, sometimes three to five years is a very long term, long term perspective for some analysts and some people managing um, other people's money. And of course, they would always have thought, in terms of the tragedy of the horizon, that these impacts from climate change wouldn't be materializing in people's lives and in the economy in the short term, that this was gonna play out over a much longer time scale. And they, of course, would be smart enough to know precisely the point at which to exercise their incredibly wonderful judgment in order to keep their clients happy with that. And it's a, it is not just a tragedy of the horizon, it's a tragedy of systemic arrogance in the world's capital markets. They have constantly devalued the importance of the natural world, natural capital in general. They have demonstrated staggering ignorance over decades. And I'm sorry to say that even now, although actually many more big institutional investors are now focused on climate risk, and there really is a a pickup, a serious um, pickup in terms of understanding of climate risk. We can maybe talk about the task force on climate related financial disclosure as part of that. Uh, when I talk to um, our companies, uh, partner companies in Forum for the Future, they'll still say the level of questioning is incredibly superficial. They have not got their heads around what climate risk really amounts to. So yes, we're seeing moves in the right direction. No question about that in terms of increased awareness, 
an understanding of the degree to which this constitutes genuine um, material risk for a lot of portfolios. But levels of, well, again, what Mark Carney called climate literacy, still, still really rather poor, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, is a, it is a tragedy because uh, there is so much that the finance sector could be doing in order yeah. to exercise their governance responsibilities. After all, generally, they're the ones who own these, these fossil fuel companies and other companies in the economy. And they should be the ones who are, are providing the pressure and the direction for, for change. Do you, do, you see, do you see things happening that, that encourage you, that, that, uh, that you, can, you can see where the yeah. finance sector can start to become a bit more of the solution and a little less of the problem? <laughs> I think, I, I don't know whether this news impacted in New Zealand in the same way as it has here in the UK, but the announcement from uh, BP just a couple of days ago that it would now not take forward scheduled developments in a lot of its oil and gas assets and that this constituted a 17 billion dollar write down therefore because those investments would not now be taken forward and not only that they would need more of that capex to invest in renewables very emphatic additional statement from the CEO of BP that the money they would still be investing, but more and more would shift into renewables. Now that's had a huge impact over here, very mixed response from people, enormous worry from the pension funds in particular, that BP will now need to reduce its dividend. Um, these oil companies have been borrowing money to pay dividends, which is if that isn't a signal of something inherently a bit dodgy, then I don't know what kind of signal you need. So the BP decision is highly significant because that is seen now as a forerunner of a large number of the big listed oil companies. So the private oil companies, not the national oil companies, but the listed oil companies needing to recalibrate their expectations. And that will impact on investors in a really big way. However, just to put the countervailing story out there, we heard yesterday from Fatih Birol, the executive director of the International Energy Agency, that it was premature to talk about 2019 being the peak oil year, the year when our demand for oil peaked and would never exceed that in all future years. He said it's perfectly possible that if governments are not smart, and do the safe thing, quotes, safe thing, by defaulting to carbon intensive recovery programs, that demand for oil could actually um, increase very rapidly indeed through 2021, which means that we would again be heading towards 100 million barrels of oil a day by the end of 2021. Now, Fatih Birol is not, he's, he's not a, a patsy for the oil and gas industry these days. He's pretty clear that we have to see this massive shift in investment away from hydrocarbons into renewables and the whole alternative energy system. But this is a very strong warning that if governments don't seize this moment to continue to de-risk their economies by decarbonizing the recovery programs, that we could see oil and gas still in there, keeping investors happy until such time as the final crunch materializes, which of course it will, it has to, because that's what the science tells us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, that's not such an encouraging uh, prognosis, but, but uh, <laughs> one of the things that you've done in, in establishing the uh, uh, Aotearoa Circle, being one of, the, one of the founders of the Aotearoa Circle, um, was to establish a sustainable finance forum. Uh, and it is kind of pretty much the only forum in New Zealand where you're getting a discussion around tackling these issues of capital markets, looking at where finance flows in the future, saying, how can we finance the transition to a, to a zero carbon future? Um, so it, it potentially has a unique role there. Can you talk a little bit about the thinking behind the Sustainable Finance Forum and, 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 and what you think its role may be in terms of, of the kind of roadmap it could, could uh, portray. Mm. 
I think this is extremely um, significant, Barry. The um, impulse behind the idea of circle, as you know, was to put this really clear spotlight on the underpinning, the physical underpinning of New Zealand's economy, those sources of natural wealth, soils, forests, rivers, coastal areas, fisheries, etc. to put the focus there. H however, you can't sort of stop at that point and just say, okay, now all we need to do is find a way of d undoing some of the damage we've done and protecting for the future and then regenerating after that. You have to understand that this is as much about physical capital as it is about financial capital. So it was brilliant that the first work stream to come forward through the ITR Royal Circle was the Sustainable Finance Forum. And the interim report that came out in 2019, and, and so far as I know, the, the work is nearly done now on the final report, um, was very clear about this. It just said that we have not, no country has successfully managed its capital markets to generate prosperity for people uh, in the short term without significantly undermining the capital, the natural capital on which long term prosperity depends. There is no country with perhaps a few exceptions, you might be able to point to Costa Rica or a few places that actually have really been ahead of this particular game and realize that wealth lies in land and in the environment as much as it does in um, financial capital and man-made assets. Um, and that interim report was very clear about that. It is one of the outstanding contributions from the a finance sector anywhere in the world. It's a very clearly written, accessible report. And for me, it demonstrated that the circle has a way now of influencing opinion here, there, in New Zealand, because it's not pretending that this is going to be an easy transition. It's saying this is tough and governments are going to have to be very mindful about what this means in terms of regulating capital markets better. So tiny point, just to give you one specific example. I know there's a debate going on in New Zealand at the moment about whether or not the disclosure around climate risk should be mandated by government for companies above a certain size. Uh, that for me is just the first baby step. If you do not force companies to disclose material climate related risks, then how can investors, both private investors and mainstream institutional investors, how can they be expected to make good decisions about the ways in which money is deployed? Now that comes, of course, through the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, um, set up initially by Michael uh, Bloomberg and Mark Carney, had a significant influence now around the world. And for me, this is a big thing for New Zealand. It, it needs to just seize hold of this opportunity and say, this is the deal. We now, as part of our recovery story here in New Zealand, we need to get on top of this. We're going to mandate that. It's the first step just to disclose risks is the first step. It doesn't necessarily lead to better management of those risks, but without disclosure, you can't even get on that path, basically. Yeah, I've, I've been kind of pleased to be involved in, in the Sustainable Finance Forum. And uh, it is interesting, uh, th there is a, a, a weight of, of uh, support behind TCFD, behind reporting, things like that. It is hard to see how we can address what, what you called the tragedy, or what, rather what Mark Carney called the tragedy of the horizon, and how we can we can start to have a finance system that doesn't think in terms of earnings over the next weeks or, or the next three months, but actually thinks about uh, the, long, the long term. Um, do you think there's a, an opportunity for New Zealand perhaps to have a somewhat more distinctive position on these things? I know you've been very much involved in, in the natural capital side. Is there other things around finance that you think that we might be able to do that uh, would mark New Zealand as, as really taking this agenda forward? I'm pretty conscious of the debate about the, the individual investor, and obviously Barry thinking of mindful money and what this actually means. Um, there are opportunities in New Zealand 
to enable individual pension holders, people with their own individual pension, to make decisions that would help build in longer term value creation. And for that to become the default setting. So that people in a way weren't expected to make what are sometimes seen as complicated decisions about the ethical or sustainable nature of different um, investment options. Um, as you know, and I imagine everybody on this call knows, actually if people do take the trouble to find out about performance in so-called ethical and sustainable funds um, at every level, whether we're talking about some of the big funds or smaller retail funds or whatever, there is no question now that those funds are outperforming uh, conventional funds. It's just that the evidence on that is just rock solid. It still astonishes me that you meet a lot of skepticism that if you choose to put your money into those um, opportunities that you are accepting that you will get a, a worse return than you would if you put them into conventional sources. There's, it is extraordinary how long it takes for absolutely rock solid evidence about outperformance by ethical and sustainable funds to trickle into the minds of financial advisors, uh, analysts, consultants, the wretched consultants who are giving so much of this advice about where people should be putting their money. So there is an opportunity for New Zealand to, to be bold about that. The superannuation system that you've got is more sophisticated than is the case in many countries. And I hope that that is something that really um, grows and grows. And I know that's pretty important for, for you and people on the call. It is interesting. So, so the uh, step from the government recently to require that our KiwiSaver funds uh, have a default setting of being free of fossil fuels is actually one of those areas where, where we have started to make that step at the time. Yeah. Some people said, well, you know, that's going to lead to, to lower returns, but uh, I think we've seen the first start of the chickens coming home to roost on, on that one with even further collapses in, in fossil fuel stock prices. Yeah. So um, there shall be plenty more to come. Um, Jonathan, we'll, we'll go to questions in one second, but I just wanted to uh, uh, finish up with, with something that uh, um, uh, is, is kind of, I, th I think, really fascinating to me. So you've been a leader on sustainability. You and I kind of met during the time of the Earth Summit 30, 30 years ago. So, so uh, uh, since then, you've, you've done lots of work and leadership across business, across UK government, international governments in New Zealand. But you're contemplating a pretty dramatic shift in direction. And your new book, Hope in Hell, which I shall just flash up on the screen if I can do this with technology. I hope that works. Uh, your, your new book, Hope, Hope in Hell, is, a, is about to come out and signals a bit of a change in direction for you. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it certainly does. Um, I think it was in the middle of last year, 2019, and of course last year was extraordinary from a climate perspective because we had a, a wonderful infusion of new energy from the school strikes, young, young campaigners saying this is outrageous what's going on from Extinction Rebellion and so on. And it caused me to sit down and look again at the science and what the science was really telling us. And then look at the political response to that science and what was the size of the gap. And of course the problem is the gap is getting bigger. The gap is not getting smaller. The science becomes more and more disturbing. Everything is getting worse everywhere, faster than anybody thought possible. That's the briefest summary of climate science you're going to have in a very long time, but that's actually it. And the political response to that around the world is patently inadequate. So the basis for my analysis in Hope in Hell is that gap is not going to be narrowed unless politicians come under a very different kind of political pressure. And for me, that means we're going to need to see a huge upsurge in political activism, including mass civil disobedience, including support for all these youth organizations that I seriously hope will come back into the foreground of all of our lives once the pandemic uh, recedes in that regard. And that those of us who've been campaigning for so many years have to accept now 
that this is not just facile rhetoric about this being the last decade to get it sorted and therefore this being 2021 being the last year to make sure that we get things landed by 2030. This is for real now. And for me personally, that means that although I love all the work that Forum for the Future still does with corporates and so on, that's not going to it's not going to make things change fast enough. And that means we have to shift the political focus onto decision makers in government and up the pressure on them so that they are, sorry to put it bluntly, compelled to do what they otherwise seem very nervous about doing. Great. And um, can, you, can you give us a, a timing for the release in New Zealand? Sure. So, Open is actually being released here in the UK a week today, but it'll be out in New Zealand on August the fifth. Okay, so so not not far away. So uh, nope. congratulations <laughs> Thanks, on uh, being prolific author as as, as always. Um, um, let's go to questions. Uh, Paul Richardson uh, has asked a really uh, good question. Thank you, Paul. Um, he's asking you if you can comment on the fact that the Stern report um, uh, had, had dealt with this issue of short-termism by saying, well, interest rates are the problem. And if interest rates go really low, then people are going to value the future more because essentially the discount rate for the future is, is less. So now that we're in an era where interest rates are kind of rapidly approaching zero, um, do you see a, this is kind of ushering in a world where people are taking longer term perspectives or are they still behaving in the same way that they were except they're uh, just in a lower interest world? I think it's too early to call that one. Um, mm. Nick Stern has been very active um, over the last uh, two or three months uh, because essentially his you know, Nick Stern is massively frustrated that governments refuse to acknowledge that the principal tenets of his report all those years ago, uh, one of which, as has just been quite rightly pointed out, was you probably need to explicitly to change the discount rate if you're going to get a proper balance between short term and medium term and long term political decision making and investment decision making. And he couldn't have been clearer about that. A lot of conventional economists, as you may recall, weighed in and just said this was outrageous um, political subversion and, and shouldn't be contemplated on any terms. So he's out there right now saying that these very low interest rates, which are likely to continue for a long time to come, could just be the trigger to change the balance of investment over the foreseeable future. I think the first, the first really good thing about incredibly low interest rates is that governments are going to be less obsessive about debt and will be inclined to put more money into recovery programs, which should include huge government supported investment in all the different opportunities that we have now to build a low carbon economy. So to give you one, uh, one quick example, I'm sure this would be matched in New Zealand. When the Tories won the election here in December last year, they did so in part off a promise to spend £29 billion on a new roads programme. Right now, of course, the call is, OK, keep the £29 billion in the recovery programme, but shift the, as much of that £29 billion as you possibly can to enable towns and cities around the UK to make these investments in better infrastructure, public transport, cycling, walking, turn, turn the whole urban environment into something which promotes this ultra low carbon economy. And public money is going to be needed to make that happen. There aren't gonna be private investors who are gonna put forward that kind of capital to shift the entire basis of urban infrastructure. So for me, low interest rates makes it possible for governments to say, yep, we're gonna do that. And guess what? It'll generate a lot of jobs and put a lot of purchasing power back into our economy at the same time, which of course is going to become increasingly important. Yeah, I, I do guess it's one thing having the opportunity to do that and it's another 
who actually do it. So uh, <laughs> there's a question here about your wish list for for um, government spending on uh, on post COVID recovery. Do you have any? You know, I, I know you you've kind of been asked these questions before, but do you have any particular um, developments or, or sort of visionary ideas for for New Zealand's re rebuilding that that uh, you'd like to share with us? I'm a huge supporter of something called the Green New Deal, which has been around as a body of ideas now for more than a decade, is a very big and encouraging source of insights in both the USA and um, here in Europe. And I think this would apply to pretty much any country in the world. But for me, the three big ones that could really make a huge difference. Firstly, the urban infrastructure, as I just mentioned, and that is very important for New Zealand. There is no reason at all why New Zealand shouldn't essentially have all of its towns and cities largely free of privately owned vehicles and responding to this opportunity for a very different kind of transport mix, um, which is available to us now. Secondly, the retrofit of existing housing. New Zealand has really poor quality housing, a lot of very poor quality housing. And one of the programs that is being given urgent attention here in the UK and elsewhere is a mass retrofit of existing housing to bring it up to something resembling the kind of quality and standards that you would expect. Again, hugely important from the perspective of generating jobs and making it possible to reskill a lot of uh, communities with um, investment in that particular thing. And then the third idea, and this is growing more slowly around the world, but I can see it kind of bubbling up now, is going right back to the original New Deal in the USA in the, in the 1930s, um, when Roosevelt launched something called the Conservation Corps. And we need, essentially, we now need the equivalent of a Conservation Corps, um, call it what you like, I called it an Earth Corps in the book that I wrote back in uh, 2013, The World We Made, where young people in particular would have um, an opportunity for paid work, properly paid work, to undertake a massive variety of conservation-based interventions um, around the country. And putting right damage done is part of it, enabling young people to understand the dependence of their country on the environment, on the physical environment, would be a brilliant way of helping um, embed those kind of views and ideas which will last throughout the rest of their lives. Fantastic, thank you, that's, uh, that's great. Um, David Woods uh, asks, um, how about conditions on receiving government support? So you've written in your report, for example, the lack of conditions on many bailouts, for example, for airlines. Um, um, is it reasonable for governments to put in conditions for climate reporting or for, for, for low emissions plans as part of their, their essentially their, their, their uh, bailout process? Mm -hmm. And if so, what, why do you think governments have been reluctant to do that? Because they put on all sorts of other conditions on bailouts. Yeah. Um, not only is it reasonable, I think it is absolutely fundamental that government should do this. Um, as your questioner has just indicated, the signals at the moment are not brilliant. So central bank funding, for instance, um, in the US, um, in Europe, so even the European Central Bank, um, and the Bank of England, have all announced their support packages for companies in trouble. And there is no systemic conditionality in any of those central bank programs at all. Now you could say that this is a response to an emergency and therefore you have to put these packages together fast and what you don't want companies to fall over just because they aren't able to meet some of the conditions that governments might ask for. But really and truly, it's a missed opportunity of staggering proportions. If you look at airlines, for instance, it's at the moment, I think still, the case that a few airlines are now imposing conditions, particularly people are talking about Air France, which has now confirmed the conditions it is asking um, 
of, of Air France, the French government is, is confirming those, that they won't be allowed to compete for some short haul flights, uh, as in competing against the railway system. Um, they're gonna to have to commit to a minimum percentage of sustainable aviation fuels in the fuels mix by 2025. But this is rare. Um, the, you know, in the US, the $25 billion package for US airlines, forget it, there's no conditionality whatsoever. So tiny little pointer in Canada, one of the world's most hydrocarbon dependent economies in the world. You may be under the impression that of course, with such a charismatic prime minister, that they don't suffer from the scourge of fossil fuels. They are utterly up to their necks in fossil fuel dependency. Interestingly, the bailout conditions for its support package have insisted that governments must, uh, the companies must now commit to TCFD disclosure. Uh, and if they can't commit to that, they won't actually get through the first hurdle for any support funding at all. Well, they, those great examples. I really like the Air France uh, restructuring that that uh, that you talked about in your report, uh, and it would make such a such a huge difference. Um, uh, Sean asks a question. Uh, Christiana Figueres uh, for, from the uh, from the UN uh, Climate Change Convention has commented recently on Radio New Zealand that the time frame for getting investment right, for getting investment into low carbon uh, alternatives to switch away from, from fossil fuel dependency. She's putting the, the time frame as being six months to 18 months. Uh, you've mm -hmm. elsewhere kind of written about the urgency of, of, of this transition. Um, is that the kind of time frame you think that we're operating to? Yeah, no, I really, uh, I really love what Christiana is saying at the moment because she's she's basically building the logic of the importance of the next eighteen months, and that in in essence means twenty twenty one really because government recovery packages are, are going to begin to emerge and land over the course of the next eighteen months, and what she has demonstrated or said, and we're, we're all on this same page, is if governments get things wrong with these recovery programs and they go back to old fossil fuel intensive ways of generating value uh, economic growth at all costs continue to um, build carbon intensive industries etc if they do all of that then we will be locked into further carbon intensive economic activity for the duration of those recovery programs. So if we miss that opportunity, it means that we won't then be able to do what we need to do by 2030. And if we can't do what we need to do by the end of 2030, then we have no chance whatsoever of maintaining the average temperature increase at below two degrees centigrade by the end of this century. And pretty much everybody, unfortunately, now is coming to the conclusion that Stabilizing at below 1.5 degrees centigrade is looking increasingly unlikely, bordering on impossible. And it is accepted that, that now is probably likely to be the scientific opinion um, emerging next year. Um, so she's simply saying 18 month window to do what we have to do to get things done in this decade. In, the, in this decade before 2030. And that's right, that puts all the emphasis on these recovery programs. If governments get this wrong around the world, if they screw this up and put for trillions of dollars, don't forget, we're not talking small beer here, we are talking trillions of dollars, which will be put forward by governments to breathe new life into their economies. If those trillions go into the wrong kind of carbon intensive, locked in economic activity, yeah, she's right. We're screwed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's it's very sobering uh, time frames for for us to work in. Um, Jonathan, we're we're just about out of time um, because we promised to keep these seminars short, not because uh, you and uh, others don't have lots to talk about, and we're we're getting some great questions coming in. So we'll just we'll just uh, conclude with with one point that several people have alluded to. Um, Rod Oram and, and Sean and others, um, which is, um, you know, our, our politicians 
actually capable of taking this agenda on and and sort of back to your your kind of future plans what are the roles of citizens in 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 taking action through mm. the various pathways available to people from from a polite murmur, murmuring through to civil disobedience yeah <laughs> okay so I don't think politicians are capable of doing this at the moment. Um, as I said before, the requisite level of understanding about the state of the planet today, this is not just a climate thing, this is collapsing ecosystems and everything else. Their actual knowledge of that, let alone deep knowledge, is far too low to enable them to be the decision makers they have to be. So I retained one, well, I retained lots of images from 2019, but one in particular, when the Sunrise Movement in the USA, uh, a young organization, young person's organization, school strikes, et cetera, et cetera, um, went to visit Nancy Pelosi, the uh, Democratic leader um, uh, in Congress, and effectively occupied her office. And Nancy Pelosi, tried and tested politician going back many decades. Most of her instincts are progressive and good. She is utterly useless on anything to do with climate change. And these young people took possession of her office and just sat there and said, look, this is not good enough. Either you and the Democratic Party get going on this agenda properly, or we are going to have to find different ways politically of making that happen. Now, of course, they lifted their occupation after a while. An interesting conversation unfolded Nancy Pelosi was fascinatingly patronizing and out there looking, for me, humiliated by this. But I read that symbolically. I think we're going to need the offices of politicians the world over occupied by young people in country after country until such time as politicians raise their game. I'm using occupied a bit metaphorically there, rather than necessarily physically, but essentially that's what the pressure's got to look like. And for me, as an oldie in this area, um, I know that part of my job is going to be to work with and support young people as they bring that pressure to bear on politicians. It's fantastic that you're going to be doing that, and we uh, we wish you uh, all, all the very best uh, for it. That's uh, that's great. Um, we're going to have to finish that, so uh, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to let people know that we're on again next week, so we've got a seminar 7pm next Wednesday, and we're continuing this theme about how to shift the finance system towards sustainability. Um, uh, Jonathan talked uh, about the Sustainable Finance Forum. Uh, we're talking with the Secretariat of the Sustainable Finance Forum, it is a real opportunity for us in New Zealand to put a progressive agenda together out there to shift not only a few participants, but to shift the system as well. So, so I think that will, uh, will be a really good conversation. Uh, we'd love uh, as many of you to join us as possible, please. Um, you can register on the website, on Mindful Money website events page, www.mindfulmoney.nz. And uh, we'll kind of very soon have this video up there on the website. Uh, I think we had some difficulty in, in the Facebook Live broadcast of this. So, so uh, we'll make sure that this video gets onto uh, uh, Facebook as soon as possible. Um, uh, I think that's about all apart from saying thank you so much to Jonathan for joining us and for your really fantastic work. Um, uh, it's great that you've made the time uh, at eight o'clock in the morning to, to join us uh, and, uh, and manage to get through the, uh, the password system on our, on our Zoom system. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, Thanks, it's, it's great work that you're doing. Thanks. Thanks all very much. Uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks, Barry. See you, Jonathan. <laughs>